And I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know that we have people joining us. My name is Darla DeMauro. I'm a professional organizer and a professional photo organizer as well. Um, today you have joined the Got Photos, Get Organized webinar that I'm hosting in honor of the second annual Save Your Photos Day. And this is uh, under the auspices of the Save Your Photos organization, which is uh, tightly aligned with my professional organization called the Association of Personal Photo Organizers. Actually, I should say that's an association I'm a member of. It's not my association. Um, so I am honored to be a member of that association, and there's a lot of great information in a uh, quickly changing field, and I wanted to share as much as I can with you um, in a, a brief format we are not going to cover everything that we could possibly cover, and I expect that you will have questions. But again, if you're joining us now, I'm just going to repeat this a couple of times at the be beginning of the call here. Thank you for calling in. I wanted to introduce again the professional organization that I am a member of that has given me so many resources that I can share with you today, and that is the Association of Personal Photo Organizers. Um, I'm also a member of the National Association of Professional Organizers, the national and the local organizations uh, of that group, and also I am a real estate stager and a home designer. So I have a lot going on uh, in my business, and that allows me to um, help with organizing and design in several different areas. So uh, if you are on Twitter and you feel like tweeting today, um, my handle is at Darla DeMauro, and uh, I would appreciate a shout-out out in the Twitter Twitterverse. Um, and I'm also, if you're not already following me, I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash heartworkorganizing, all one word. Uh, but the most important thing on this slide is, is I've gone ahead and listed all of the resources that we might be talking about a little bit later so that you don't have to write everything down. And so there's a special page on my website, heartworkorg.com slash photos. And I'll say that again, and you can just write it down. And you can go straight to that page and get information on some of the technology and tools and, um, and resources that I want to make available to you. And so that page, again, is heartworkorg.com slash photos with an S on the end. Um, and that is going to help you out, and you can focus on the content here and, and not necessarily be furiously writing when I go through uh, a lot of this information today. So um, I wanted to start out with some statistics because uh, I know that being overwhelmed with photos is um, – something that a lot of people feel, and they feel that they're alone in this. And I wanted to show you, just if you just briefly look at the bar graph and the fact that uh, one trillion photos will be taken in two, 2015, and um, if all the photos in, the, in a year, uh, stored in a year, were printed as four-by-six prints and lined up end-to-end, -end, they would stretch out uh, 1.1 round trips from the Earth to the Sun. So I wanted to, you know, give you that perspective and let you know that if you feel overwhelmed by your photos, you are not alone. And actually, I took this slide from a um, from a colleague of mine, Sue Thornton, who's also a photo organizer, and I took this off of one of the newer social media sites called Instagram. You may be familiar with it, you may be using it, um, or you may not be, uh, but this is one of the reasons that uh, we are so inundated with photos now is we are, you know, everybody's walking around with these great mobile devices that give us a lot of power, and we are now doing things which we've never in history done before, like taking pictures of our lunch and, you know, taking pictures of the car that we're parked next to in the amusement um, park lot, you know, just so we can remember where we were parked. Um, so we're using photos in a different way than we ever have in history, and we're taking a lot more of them. So it's very um, understandable that we would feel overwhelmed by our photos today. And we are going to talk about technology today, and I'm going to give you a lot of tools and resources, but I want to remind you first that we are a people of stories. And that's really why we take most of our pictures. 
Um, so later in the presentation, if you start to feel like we are going through a lot of technology and you're starting to feel a little overwhelmed again, just come back to this because this is what it's all about. I love to help people find amazing photos that they've forgotten. I love to help them rediscover their past, but really it's about telling your story. This picture that I have on the screen right now is actually a picture of my daughter on a trip that we took this summer to Paris. Now, I could spend the rest of our time together telling you about what's in the background and, and why this picture was amazing and what she was doing on that day, and, and it seems to be a regular old photo, but there's a story behind it, and there's a story behind our entire trip. It's one of the best photos. It just happens to be one of the best photos from our trip. Um, but you have in your archive, in your shoeboxes, in your albums, you have a handful of pictures that really, really tell your story well. And that's what we always want to come back to as photo organizers and as people with photo archives because that is really what we're doing, telling our story through pictures. And I love this quote, photography is a way of feeling, of touching, and of loving. And that's really true. That's why we do what we do. But our memories are at risk. You can see on this picture in the slide that, you know, many of us have pictures that are sort of, they've been shuffled from one room to another. Maybe there's a renovation project that goes on and, and uh, our photos get moved and maybe some of them never quite make it into albums, so they get shuffled in with other pictures. And in, in this photo, uh, we're showing that uh, this client was using a galvanized tub a galvanized metal tub, and a copy paper box to hold probably decades worth of photographs in a very disorganized manner. And those photos are getting crunched, they're getting uh, ripped, they're getting um, you know, wrinkled on the edges, so those photos are at risk. But even if they're stored in the best storage bins possible, right, even if they're in albums or boxes, um, what I'm showing on the right here, and uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it, um, now that I've imported in, into a slide presentation. But on the top, there's a picture of a cat, and most of that picture is pink. And on the bottom, it's the same picture, but with the color restored. And so what we need to know is that even if we're storing pictures, as we're supposed to, in a well um, ventilated in a well, you know, in a, in a good um, physical environment, in the same environment hopefully that we live in, inside our homes, um, even if they're in, in a high quality album and they're not getting wet and they're not getting uh, crunched or damaged in another way, color photos are still fading. There are always three color processing, red, yellow, blue. The blue fades first, the yellow fades next. And what we're left with, and a lot of us actually own these pictures from the 70s and the 80s still, um, and even from the 90s I've seen some that have all faded to very pink pictures. And what I wanted to show you is that those can be restored pretty easily. So as you go through your photos, just keep in mind that the photos are at risk, but when we digitize them, we have some uh, better options to, to see uh, those photos. Um, Okay, so I'm on the ABCs of photo organizing album, and I can see here again the slide went a little wonky on me, so I apologize for that. But I just want to take one second and greet anyone who's joined the call in the last 10 minutes and to remind you that you can be listening to this call on the phone, and in the same email that I sent to you, there's a link, and if you're able to click on that link from your mobile device or from a computer, you'll be able to see the slides that I'm sharing. If you can't get to those, no worries. Uh, I am going to um, share as much as I can with you on the phone here, and you'll still be getting some great information about how to organize your physical and digital photos. So this is where we start, again, the ABCs of photo organizing. M my peers and I like to break this down into the ABCs. We talk about when you do go through your photos, whether it's physical or digital photos, we talk about uh, separating your photos and being able to make decisions about which are A's, which are B's, and which are C's. And 
We talk about the A's as being the, the top tier, your best of the best, the photos that you would like to keep in albums and probably pass down to the next generation. These are photos that um, if they got damaged, you would probably do some, some uh, work to restore them and um, that they are really the, the essence of the stories that you are trying to, to tell. The B photos... That B stands for box, okay? So the A stands for album, and the B stands for box. These might be photos that, as you're going through, um, could be maybe important, but not your top-tier um, albums, uh, not your top-tier album photos. They're not maybe the ones that you would spend money to convert into a digital form if they started out in a physical form, uh, if they're older pictures. They're ones that you want to put aside and maybe store, but maybe they aren't the absolute best that you would pass along to the next generation. And then the C's are stands for can, C stands for can, and those are the photos that you would actually um, eliminate from your collection and that you would actually toss and, and throw out. And uh, as we go through a lot of the older albums with folks, and even my own albums, I know, there are a lot of, you know, repeat pictures. There's, um, of course, we used to always buy duplicates. There's a lot of thumbs and feet. And um, there's a lot of photos that we can actually toss. And so I give you permission to do that at this point. And the S, the ABCs of photo organizing ends with an S. And that, again, is just a reminder that we are going through this not for the technical effort of reducing a large amount of photos or, um, you know, technical whatever in the digital world, we're actually trying to tell your story. So as you go through the photos, make sure that you are, in fact, picking out ones that really tell a balanced and complete um, story about you. So I'm going to give you some steps on how to think about organizing physical photos, first of all. Um, the physical photos are, you know, they're nice to be able to handle. Um, they have, uh, oftentimes they come with, with duplicates and, um, and negatives and all sorts of other things. But what you want to do in general are these five steps. Um, and they're the five steps on the slide, but I'll repeat for those people who may not be looking at the slide. So your physical photos, the way that we... Uh, actually go through and the steps that we go through to organize them are sorting. The first one is sorting your photos by category. Now, for many people, that, that category will be a chronological uh, category. So it might be by year, by decade, um, by period in your life. Uh, and that's, that's a good way to do categorization. Not everybody, however, will want that type of category or will want that for their entire collection. Um, many clients that I, that I do books for will actually select their photos by decade and will create family albums by decade. Um, however, if you have, let's say you have a fabulous vacation home in you know, wherever, Martha's Vineyard or wherever, you may actually have a category of photos that just travel through um, that, the history of that uh, that property. So your category may be your main home, your vacation home, um, and, and that's valid. Your category may be different family branches, and that could also be just as valid as decades. So once you've gone through and you've sorted photos by category, and again, you've, you've, you're applying the ABCs, you know, you're figuring out, okay, these are my best albums, these are uh, album pictures, these are my Bs, I'm going to store them, but maybe not do anything else with them, and then I'm going to edit out some that just really don't add anything to my story. Um, I know when I went through my own pictures, I've got pictures of, you know, friends, dogs, from 20 years ago, and I honestly can't remember who the friend is or what the dog was or what their name was. So, you know, that type of picture maybe is hugely important if that dog was very important to you. Me, I've got, you know, random pictures of dogs that I'm easily able to eliminate out of my collection. That's just one example. So uh, with your physical photos, the second step is to store your originals. And you want to store them in a, in a container that's archival quality. And the words you want to look for on any um, storage materials are acid-free and lignin-free. And lignin is spelled L-I-G-N-I-N. Lignin is a product that comes from wood 
materials, wood-based materials. It's a um, an acid that comes out of uh, uh, wood-based, you know, paper items that come from wood if they haven't been treated, if they haven't um, been made photo safe. And so you want to store your originals in albums that are, I say, modern albums that are um, photo uh, quality. We all have, including myself, we all have those horrible, horrible, sticky, what what we used to call magnetic albums. They're not magnetic at all, but they have a glue in them. And those um, are not photo safe. We all have them. We all use them in the 70s and 80s. But you actually do want to re- remove um, items out of those um, because they're not good storage containers. They're actually degrading and eating your pictures um, as we sit here. And then the third step is to scan and edit your best photos. So if you have physical photos from decades before we were digital, which has only been about the last 10 years, you may want to, not in all cases, but you may want to actually take your best photographs, your older photographs, and scan them, digitize them, and then go through a a light editing process at the very least. And that's doing things like on the picture I showed you before, taking um, the pink pictures and restoring the... the, uh, the color, and then doing things like minimal cropping and, um, you know, reducing red eye, all these minimal edits that can be done really very quickly um, by a, uh, you know, not by you necessarily, although many people do have the tools to do this. It may not be something that you want to do. So photo labs, photo organizers like myself, we can do all of these things for you. Once you scan and edit your best copies, you want to back up your digital copies and then back them up again. So you have the rule of thumb in the industry is that we have three copies of your photos in two different places, and that's the minimum. So you could have more backups, but once you've turned something into a digital copy, it it now is um, very accessible, very shareable, very... Uh, translatable into gifts and books and all sorts of other things, but it also has a frailty that if the device or the disk or um, the storage facility, the cloud storage where it, with stored or your computer, if any of those breaks, then that there's a risk that that data could be gone. So that's why we say back up your digital photos and then back them up again. And then the last step on doing something with your physical photos is once you've organized them, once you've uh, scanned and edited and stored them, create something with them so that other people can enjoy what you've, you know, your memories, so that you can really tell that story. So for a lot of people, it's creating a physical album. And for some people, it's getting photos up on their wall. For other people, it might be creating gifts. And for a lot of people, and this is no joke, but a lot of people get to a certain point in their photo organizing projects and they turn to me and say, great, I finally have something to share on Throwback Thursday now. And that's fun. I mean, it's not a uh, long-term storage solution for sure, but if you um, frequent Facebook and you enjoy sharing materials there, then absolutely creating a keepsake might be including sharing some of your photos with uh, you know your followers and your friends on Facebook. So that's the basic uh, how to go through physical photos. Uh, I wanted to give you on this slide, I'm sorry if you're not looking at the slides right now, thank you for the folks who have joined in and click that link on the email that I sent so that you can be looking at the slides that I'm talking about. But um, So if you are looking at the slides, you'll see a photo organizing project that we did and what it looks like at the end. We've basically sorted these photos into piles on the table, and then on top of each pile, I have a little marker. It's a an index card that allows us to write what the categorization is. In this case, it was years. It was chronological. And then um, also we added some events, so it might have been a significant event within the decade. And then we've also got also got markers on here where we can say whether this batch was scanned, whether this batch has been entered into an album. Um, so that we know where we are at on this this uh, journey of photo organizing, because although we may sort photos in a day, you're probably not going to be able to go through all of those steps in your photos, getting them to a finished product in a day. So you're going to have to put them down, put them away, come back. 
And you'll see also on this table that as we were going through photos, we found things like a floppy disk and a few random slides and a VHS tape and even some undeveloped film. So there's, you know, these random things that come up in your photo organizing projects that you may want to go back and get some of the data off. And believe it or not, I do have clients who have these floppy disks who might have a picture or two on those floppy disks. The picture, it, they're not very big. They don't hold a lot, the, the floppy disks. So um, there might only be a handful of pictures on there. But we do have the technology to get that off of a floppy disk, even though your modern computer most likely does not have a slot to put those disks in. So uh, just very quickly, I do have a great article on my website of five types of photos to toss. And these are actual pictures that people have tossed as we've been organizing. And I've said, hey, can I, you know, can I take this picture and add it to my things you can easily toss? So you can go to my website and read this whole article called Five Types of Photos to Toss. Um, and I, you can see them here. One is a, a, a sea horizon or an ocean horizon. We have no idea where that horizon is, if it's in New Jersey or, um, you know, could be Australia for all I know, could be anywhere. Um, so it's really a non-identifying type of picture. And then down below you can see a cityscape of happens to be of Philadelphia, but there's really nothing in the picture that tells your story. That's a random picture. It's, it happens to be badly faded, so it's old. But we don't know if that was the first time you visited Philly or the tenth time or, you know, who you were with. It really doesn't say anything about your story. The third picture is a, it's actually a picture of a giraffe. You have to look right in the middle, sort of way far in the background to see it. It's very hard to see what it is to begin with. And secondly, what's the big deal about the giraffe? Were you at Brookfield Zoo? Were you at the Philadelphia Zoo? Was it, you know, someplace in Europe? Who knows? Who were you with? You know, were you a child? Were you, were you taking a grandchild? It's just there's nothing in that story. It's just sort of a random giraffe. Um, the fourth picture, yes, it's a bride. You can't really tell on this uh, slide presentation, but if you were to look at the actual picture, you would see that it's actually a very bad picture. It's very fuzzy. Um, it's not a great picture of her dress. There are a million great pictures of that bride of that day, and that's not one of them. So that was easily tossed. And then the last picture is a picture of feet, random feet. Not really, again, advancing the story that you probably want to tell. So um, on the next slide, I just bring up the concept that we've got, it's not just pictures, it's all the artwork and the keepsakes from kids and from, uh, maybe it's not your own kids, it could be nieces, nephews, it could be neighbor kids that you have a really close relationship with, but uh, certainly moms and dads end up with this uh, usually portfolio. It's usually a huge envelope or a, a plastic bin of stuff that their kid brought home from preschool all the way to high school. And uh, that stuff usually is not well cared for. It's been knocked around, and again, it's getting torn and uh, damaged. And instead of having it be taking up a lot of space and getting damaged and not having a lot of value 20 or 30 or 40 years later when you might finally pass it to your kid, who is now an adult, uh, what we did in the bottom of this photo is to scan and photograph everything and turn it into a beautiful, um, high-quality, sturdy photo album that now becomes the actual portfolio for this child who's now an adult. And this is one we just finished, um, and it's, it's beautiful. I, I was able to share this in person when I gave this same presentation this week. But um, uh, these are the kinds of things that you can do with, with articles that you just don't know what to do with. Uh, so it's not just photos. It's memorabilia as well. And I want to... Um, I'm just going to break in on myself here and remind you that if you are listening to this presentation um, and you want to see the slides that I'm showing you, you want to go to the RSVP um, email that I sent and click on that link and you'll be able to, um, it'll take you right to the presentation where you're seeing the slides that I'm going through. So I want to tell you again, you know, remind you that this is about your story. You want to tell your story. And the picture that I have on this uh, slide is a picture of the Eiffel Tower. Again, we were just in Paris, my daughter and I. And 
everybody who's ever been to Paris has a picture of the Eiffel Tower in their album. But this picture tells our story. This picture has the Eiffel Tower in the background. It, I did manage to cut it off at the very top, unfortunately. But um, she's actually in a playground right underneath the Eiffel Tower, and she was playing on slides and, and stairs and all these playground equipment items that were, who knew, right at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. There's actually several of them, merry-go-rounds and, and whatnot. And somebody else who, you know, has a different experience in Paris, they're going to have a different story and a different photo. But this is really what our, what our trip ended up being about, is how many, how many awesome playgrounds that could we find in places that we didn't expect, like ones at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. So that's what I mean by telling your story. I want you to take your photographs, but have some kind of, um, you know, amazing point, or if it's not in the photograph itself, have two photos that go together. Maybe you have a picture of the Eiffel Tower and then one of the carousel that's right at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. And those two go together. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we want to do to tell your story. Okay, moving right along, we want to, and I'm, um, I'm trying to hurry this up. There's a lot of content. So, I, you know, we're not going to answer all your questions. I do encourage you to write down your questions, and then you can email them to me, and I, I'll be happy to get back to you um, off after the webinar. But I want to make sure you're getting some good information out of this webinar. Um, so now we're moving into the digital photography world, and I wanted to share with you another photograph that was that tells the story of a family and why we managed, why we took the time to do something with that photograph digitally. Now this photograph started digital. It was just taken this year of a family, and their story is that they always find rainbows wherever they go. So in their family album every year, there's always one, usually more, pictures of rainbows with this family. And the picture on the left is the one that they that was taken of them. And it's very dark. You can see the rainbow in the back, but the family is dark. Like you can't see the little boy's face at all. Um, and that was the picture that was taken. That's what they had. That's what she handed me and said, I want this in the album. And I could have just put it in the album, but because it's digital photography, or even if it's a picture that we had scanned, um, oftentimes we can bring it back to a photograph that makes a whole lot more sense. And you can see that on the right side where we still see the, the rainbow in the background. But now we've lightened up the front of the picture and we can actually see all three people's faces. And that's the photo that goes in the album, and it tells their story. If we had not saved that photograph, if she had said, oh, you know, that's the only rainbow that we had this year, and um, that is, you know, it's just not good enough to go in the album, or that was the one, you know, if she had said, look, it has to go in the album because that's my only rainbow, but we wouldn't have been able to see their faces, that really would have been a shame. That would have been a piece of their story missing. So by editing, lightly editing these photographs, we can get them and we can tell their story. That was so important that we include this photo in, um, in their, their album. So I want to give you just a quick idea of as you're taking photographs, you know, I am not a great photographer, neither is this family. You know, most of us aren't. Most of us are not professional photographers or even good photographers. Um, but we can take the photos that we have and make them better. That is the awesome thing about digital photography. Now, there are, of course, downsides of digital. Image database file error recover. <laughs> This is a, a shot that I took with my iPad, and I took it of the, the back of my camera. The story is we were in Paris, and we, were, we had about three days left on our trip. And um, my camera, my good camera that I was taking all the photographs with, freaked out um, with three days left to go on our trip, and it tried to dump all of my photos. And at first, you know, my heart jumped out of my chest. And I saw this error, and I thought, oh, no, all my pictures. Well, of course, I do practice what I preach. So every single night on our trip, I downloaded my photos to both drop to, well, to three places, actually. I downloaded my photos from my camera to my iPad and also to Dropbox and to Mylio, which I'll share with you in a second. But when my camera said, database errors, I'm about to dump all your photos because this 
photo card that's in here looks like it's corrupted. If I had not been backing up my photos, all of those photos would have been at risk. So this is more common than you would think. And I I like to think that everything that I go through is in the service of my clients so that I can share it. But this really happens, and it happens often, and I don't ever want it to happen to you. But if it does, I want your photos backed up. So if you take nothing else away from our time today, make sure that you know how to back up your precious photos as you're taking them and as you're storing them. So we want, uh, we want two things, actually. We want an online backup and we want an offline backup. And that is, I'm going to go through with you some of the tools that you can use to do that. So this is a photo of um, one of the things that I own that might be a great solution for you. And, you know, the holidays are coming up. If this is a holiday gift that you can ask for, uh, I think it's a great solution. Um, but it's called Live. L-Y-V-E. It's on the resource list. By the way, if you joined us a little bit later in the presentation, I have a resource list that's available to you. I'll just give you the website now, and you can write it down. And all of these things that I'm talking about, like live and like the few that are coming up, they're already listed with the links where you could go order them if you want to order them. Um, so you don't have to write everything down here. And that website that you can go to is on my page. It's heartworkorg.com slash photos, and that ends with an S, P-H-O-T-O-S. So Live is a solution that I use. It came out uh, about two years ago. It lo- it's, a, it's essentially an external hard drive, but it's a hard drive that's been um, specialized for photos. It only holds photos. It does it in a very automated way, photos and videos, I should say. It does it in a very automated way, so it will pull them automatically off of my Um, computer and my uh, mobile devices. You can see in the little inset picture that there's also uh, ports so that you can pop a camera card or you can pop a a jump drive or um, an external device right into Live, and it will also suck in all the pictures. And it's also got a display screen on the front. Here in the picture it looks black, but it's a rolling display screen so that it's actually showing um, photos that it is archiving. It's a great backup solution. Um, It's not all that expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars, and actually the price has come down, uh, I noticed, the other day. So if you're worried about backing up and you don't want to necessarily put things in the cloud and you want to know that they are, in fact, safe in your home, Live is a, a great solution. It's a great hard drive solution. So when you think about your digital wish wish list and being able to back up and save and share and manipulate all of your photos, you know, I have a pretty good wish list on what I expect my digital photo solution to do. And I'll just let the cat out of the bag, and and some of you guys have heard me talk about MyLeo. It's the thing you've never heard of, but it's the one that you need. Um, It it actually meets all the criteria on my digital wish list here. And again, I have an article on my website. So just for time's sake, I'm going to uh, kind of gloss over this. But when we talk about digital photos, you know, you want to have, you want some basic things. You want to have all your photos available to you all the time, no matter whether you're looking at your computer, your phone, your iPad, your Android. You want to be able to get to that. I mean, ideally, that would be nirvana, right? You'd be able to get to your photos all the time. Your photos are always yours and always private. Now, that's a big one for me. I do not like the idea of my photos being um, available to a major corporation who can change their policies at any time. And Facebook, you might know, is notorious for changing um, changing your privacy settings on your Facebook account randomly. A lot of people, um, you know, have seen that they'll set their account to private and then there'll be a system upgrade on Facebook and they'll come back and all of a sudden their privacy settings aren't what they had previously set them to. So, you know, Google, Facebook, they're great tools, they're amazing technology, but they don't necessarily meet my personal privacy criteria from pictures of my little people in my household. So... um, You know, you want your pictures to be available on all your devices, but you don't want to lose all your phone's memory just because you have a million pictures that you'd like to be able to see. 
Uh, you want to be able to make one, if you do edit your pictures, you want to be able to make that edit once and have have all of your devices then have that same edit flow through so you don't have to go back and, and make changes on everything. Um, if you already have your photos pretty organized on your computer, then it would be ideal to take that organization structure and use it instead of making you start over. If you use a photo software like Lightroom, you want to be able to integrate that so you can use all the powerful features of a tool, of a photo editing tool. Um, and MyLeo actually does that. If you are a photo um, pretty proficient photographer and you like to shoot in RAW, a lot of the services where photos get stored these days can't actually manage the RAW format. It's R-A-W. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. But a lot of people um, like to be able to shoot in RAW because it gives them more flexibility with um, making edits on their pictures later. And uh, MyLeo was actually designed for a photographer who uses RAW, and so that uh, will also handle, it'll handle JPEG, which is what most of us, including myself, use, but it'll also handle this other format called RAW. Um, you also, and this is really, really important to me, if, if a system that you've decided to use for photo storage were to disappear, were to go out of business, or were to get gobbled up by a bigger company, or you just decided, you know what, I don't want to pay the service fee anymore, or I, something better has come along, you don't want to be trapped in that photo service. So if that photo service isn't available to you anymore, you want to be able to say, no big deal, I've still got all my photos in all the same places with all the changes that I've already made. Um, so those are kind of the biggies. And then you want things like your family access. You want to be able to use it no matter what you know phone you're using. Some people will switch back and forth between an Apple phone one year and an Android phone the next version um, because it's got different features, and then they may go back to an Apple phone. And so you don't want to be beholden to just one system that you can't use on you know half of the technology that you might be using. Or your family may be split. You may be an Apple user, and he may you know your husband may be an Android user, but you still want to be able to have a family um, repository for all your photos. So uh, all of these things are important. And, you know, oh, and yeah, by the way, you want it to be able to handle video too. Uh, so you don't want this great photo solution and have it not be able to handle a few or a lot of videos that you might be taking. And you don't want to have to go to college to be able to figure out how to use it, right? It should be pretty easy to use. So all of these things are um resident in my favorite platform, which is called MyLeo, and that's also available on the resources page, which I set up for you. So if you're interested in checking it out either for a free trial or for the paid subscription, which is what I use, that's sort of the middle, there's three versions um, in addition to the paid, uh, excuse me, in addition to the free version, there's three paid versions. And I kind of, most of my clients end up on the um, middle version, and that's what I use as well. So um, on your digital wish list, you know, hopefully I gave you some things to think about, uh, some things that you want to incorporate in your own ideas of how you're managing your pictures. Uh, this slide up here next, and you can certainly log into just um, uh, log into the resources page and get to MyLeo. But this just shows you what the MyLeo screen looks like. You can see that I have 33,000 photos in MyLeo. They're actually stored on my hard drive. They're backed up as well, and they are also, um, I can get to any picture at any time on my iPad. So I have 33,000 pictures, and I could see a picture of the very first day of my daughter's, you know, my older daughter's life um, on my iPad, even though it's actually stored on my computer. So it's pretty cool that I could find it in about two seconds and um, that it's not taking up additional space on my iPad um, that I can find it through MyLeo. So digital photos. I'm going to give you a really quick uh, you know, way to think about how you want to go through, just like I did with physical photos. I gave you five steps. It's pretty much the same steps, one big difference in the order that we're going to take on. With physical photos, what you like to do is get them organized, sort of get them unmessy first, and then to do something with them. With digital, however, I'm going to ask you not to do that. The big difference in how you approach digital and physical photos is with digital photos, I want you to back up the mess 
first. So even if you feel like you have a mess between your computer and your phone and your camera and all these disks that you have from years gone by and jump drives and old hard drives and old computers maybe that you're only keeping under the desk because you're terrified that there might be some old family pictures on there and you haven't been able to get them off yet, you know, all of that's kind of messy, right? It's all in these different places. But what you want to do is to back all of that up in one place first and then go through, make sure that you have everything, but then you deduplicate, you remove the duplicates. And when you deduplicate, sorry, that's a hard word to say, deduplicate, you want to take out the smaller pictures. You always want to keep the bigger pictures. So there are lots of software programs that you can um, help with that. that, uh, And some of the photo programs themselves will help you as well. But usually you're you're adding on a, um, a photo deduplication program using that. And you always want to keep the bigger photo because you can always squeeze a bigger photo down into a smaller version. But once you have a small version of a photo, you can't increase the size without having it pixelate and get all fuzzy and wonky on you. So that's just a little tip on deduplication. Keep the bigger file size. And then um, I like to rename. Not everybody does like to rename, but I really think once you have your pictures organized and uh, they're in digital, they're all sort of together, then it makes sense to go back and, d- and rename your photos. And I will tell you that uh, if you're taking notes, the, um, the uh, sorry, I'm just noticing here, Julie, I did change the slide. Hopefully you see the new slide um, and you're not stuck. If you are, you may want to, re-click on the, the uh, link and come back in and see if you can see it again. But we're talking about digital photos, and I have several steps on how we manage those. Okay, so renaming. So the file format that I like to use is year-year-month-month, actually four digits for the year, so 2015-09- and then an event name. So it might be 2015-09 back to school. And that's, uh, you want to rename in batches. You're not going to do them all individually. I have 33,000 photos, and those don't get renamed individually. They get batched. Um, so then I'll have back to, photo, back to school one, back to school two, back to school three, and your computer does that for you um, if you're rebatching. And then, uh, and then you want to back up your digital copies someplace else. Okay, so that you end up with those three copies in at least two places. And that's physical, um, physical here, physical in a safe deposit box, physical at a family member's house, and then maybe a cloud service and maybe a second cloud service. So you want at least three, maybe more backups. And then you want to edit the best. So when you've got your digital um, versions, uh, your digital photos all together, and that may include physical photos that you've already scanned, and now they've become digital, so now they're in this this uh, entire batch of your photos. So you want to edit the best. You're not going to edit everything, but you can go through and you can lightly color correct. You can remove red eye. You can crop so that you have a better picture. You can straighten it so the horizon's not all, you know, hanging off the left side, that sort of thing. And then lastly, same step as we saw before, you want to create a keepsake. And that might be a digital album that you can email to somebody and have them take a look at. It might be um, a family album. A lot of families that I work with, they go through once a year. Uh, usually it's at the end of the year, right before the end of the year, right after. And we create an amazing family album. Um, and the great thing is that if you have more than one kid, you can now, you know, you don't have to worry about does, that, does this photo go with kid one or kid two. But you can create a family album, and then you can purchase as many copies of that album as you want. Usually every Thanksgiving I create a family album of our year, and I get six copies, and they go to grandparents and aunts and uncles, and those are actually Christmas presents for my family. So, um, And then I get an extra one for me and maybe one for the kids or one for each kid. So uh, that's just a really great, great benefit now of having digital photos. Okay, this next slide that I just went to, I've mentioned a couple of things. I've mentioned backup a couple of times, and you might be thinking, well, but, 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 you know, my, my computer is so uh, full, I'm, I don't know what to back up to. So I have a slide, and it shows three things on it. 
One is called Picture Keeper, and there's two versions that I show here. Picture Keeper is something that I share on my resource page. Again, it's heartworkorg.com slash photos. You can go right there and link right over to it. Um, but the, it looks like a flash drive. The little one sort of looks like a flash drive, but it's got software on it that only looks for pictures. So if you were to have that, um, you know, if you're, if you're one of those people that has an old computer and you're afraid to get rid of it because it might have family pictures on it, this Picture Keeper is fabulous because it goes into the computer, you plug it right in, and it goes and looks for all your photos, and it pulls them onto the Picture Keeper. And if you have two or three or four of these old computers, you can just plug it in one right after another, and it'll pull all the po photos right off your computer. And now you can bring them over to your brand new computer that you've been using, and you're all clear. Um, the other thing it does is if you use this as a backup, you can fill it up. You can use it until it's full, and then if you have to buy another, another one, when you plug it in the second time, I'm sorry, when you plug in the second drive, it'll pick up where the first one left off. So it's a great way to back up your photos on your main computer. Um, if you have just a handful of, of, of photos, you can get by with a small picture keeper that looks like a jump drive. However, you see in the middle of this picture, the picture keeper drive. And it is actually a hard drive with the same um, software on it that is just uh, looking for pictures. So if you plug that hard drive into your computer, it's going to make a backup copy of all the photos on your computer. And this one is huge. It will hold up to 320,000 pictures. So you saw before, I have 33,000 pictures in my MyLeo account right now. And um, this Picture Keeper drive would absolutely hold all of them. And then on the right-hand side of this picture, I have a non-specific uh, it's a, a sort of an all-purpose hard drive, and it's a Seagate drive, which I'm not going to recommend Seagate anymore. There are plenty of other brands out there. This one happens to be uh, one terabyte, but I'm recommending you look for a two or a three terabyte at this point. You'll spend about 100, 150 bucks on a two to three terabyte drive, and um, that is a great place, you know, ha leave it plugged into your computer or plug it into your laptop once every week and make sure that it's backing up not only photos, but everything else on your computer as well, documents and everything else. Okay, we're starting to wind down and run out of time, and I just wanted to bring up the concept of the cloud. Uh, you know, when people talk about the cloud, oftentimes they are talking about the Apple cloud. However, that is just one version. And that's just one place where you may or may not choose to store your photos. So I wanted to give you this graphic, and those people who are logged in can see that you know we have inputs, we have um, your computer, we have cloud services that are helping us out, and then we have outputs. So this is kind of what we've been talking about all the way through this presentation. In the middle, you can see your computer is attached to an external hard drive, the EHD, the external hard drive, as well as some software that you might be using to manipulate your photos. Again, the, some of the most popular ones are iPhoto and Lightroom. Um, if you're on Windows, they have something called Live Essentials. They keep changing the name of it on, on Windows, but it's either Windows Essential or Windows Essential Live or Windows Live. Um, but it's the resident photo program that usually comes with um, Microsoft Windows. And then up top, you see that I've got several different clouds listed. The first one that I recommend if you're not already using it is Carbonite if you're using a PC, and Backblaze if you're using a Mac. Those are all-purpose cloud backups. They'll back up not only photos, but everything on your PC if you have them, um, if you're subscribed and you have them set up correctly. So if you don't already have them, they are on my resource page. Please click over to my resource page and um, sign up from there. there. It's the cheapest insurance you'll ever buy. For $60 a year, you know, if your computer ever goes south on you, you're going to be thinking, why didn't I have this? So Carbonite and Backblaze, that's your first cloud type of service that you want to be using. Um, but those are great general all-purpose um, you know, backup services for everything on your computer. And then you have what we're calling apps now. We used to call them software, but now we call them apps. So 
Uh, Mylio is my favorite. I talked to you about that. But again, there's others. There's Amazon. There's Picture Keeper. They, I showed you the hardware, but Picture Keeper actually has a software and app that you can sign into on your iPhone and, and whatnot. Shutterfly has an app as well. So these are all apps that will, will specifically manage your um, photos in a backup situation. And then we've got other all-purpose clouds um, like Dropbox. That's kind of the big one in the space. Again, if you're not using Dropbox, um, it's, it's not really a great backup solution for photos long term. It is a great way to move things from one device to another. Um, so if you have an iPhone or an iPad, it's a great way to move photos from here to there. Um, but it's not a good backup solution. For that, you want to do something like Mylio or Carbonite or Backblaze. Um, iCloud is on here because it's kind of its own thing, but there's a lot of things iCloud doesn't really do, and people think it, people really think that it does everything. Um, last April, Apple did a major upgrade on their uh, iCloud and their Photos platform, and uh, there were a lot of changes, and people, including people in my industry, are still trying to catch up to what it's doing and what it's not doing. So, um, you know, let's not assume. Let's make sure that your photos are saved. Let's make sure they're backed up someplace other than iCloud because when Apple makes a change again, you don't get to opt out of their changes. You're, you have to go along with their changes once you update your services. And then um, photo sharing services like Snapfish and Shutterfly, um, you might be using or have heard of Picasa, and Flickr is another one. Flickr is great. It's free for a terabyte of storage in the cloud. You know, it's got some things it doesn't do. Um, if Picasa is not long for this world. Google has brought out two other photo services since Picasa was, um, was introduced about, I don't know, six, seven years ago. So if you're using Picasa, that's fine, but just be aware it's probably not going to be around forever. Um, so that, so I want to go back just to, this is your digital ecosystem, and these are all things, you don't have to be an expert in any of them, but you should have a good handle on what's on your computer, you should have a hard drive, you should have cloud services somewhere backing up your photos, and you should know that you can get outputs, you can get family albums, you can get discs, you can get GIFs, and you can be even showing your photos on a TV. Um, that's the newest technology. So we're just wrapping up here. We're right on time. Thank you for sticking with me. And um, we've got six must-do photo organizing tips. I'm just going to rattle these off for you. So you want to, you know, we've talked about all these. You want to download your pictures and videos from your phone every single month at least, if not more. You know, people send me articles about it's some hard luck story about somebody who lost their phone and it was that was the only place their pictures of their son ever were and their son has since passed away and it's just heart-wrenching to see that you know that that losing the phone or breaking a phone or a phone getting stolen is so so uh devastating for families and it doesn't have to be that way um so you want to download your pictures you want to back up your backup so back up your pictures and then back up your backup um, and I, every first of the month, I go onto my Facebook page and I give you a reminder to do several things. And one of them is to each month quickly go through and delete stuff off of your phone that you know you're never going to need. You know, if you had, a, if you took a picture of a, I don't know, a shopping list or something like that last month because you needed it for a day, um, great, that was helpful to you, but that's not like a picture that needs to be in your forever archive. So every first of the month, while you're sitting watching TV or sitting in the you know, your kid's pickup line at uh, carpool or whatever, go through and just quickly delete some pictures off your phone. That will give you some more storage and get rid of some of the, you know, junk that's on your um, archive. And if you do it through Mylio, it's going to manage not only to take it off of Mylio, but it will take it off of your um, hard drive on your computer and your phone at the same time. So that's kind of cool. Um, make sure that when, you're, when you are working with your photos that you batch rename them. Uh, that year, year, and actually I, that should be four digits, so 2015-09- back to school, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I do really recommend, if you haven't done it up to this point, making annual photo books for your family. If you don't have the time, then I'll make them for you. That's what a lot of people um, bring me in for and hire me for. Um, and the uh, trick to that, by the way, is whatever service you're using, whether it's Shutterfly or Blurb or, you know, any any 
type of service. I'm not going to name them all. But you might um, think about making those albums and then just leave them in your shopping cart. And when the sales roll around, especially around the holiday time, you can order it then. And it takes a lot of stress off and you'll be getting a great discount. Um, and then my last tip here is make sure that you share your, your pictures with your younger family members while you can still tell your story. So certainly, you know, if we're in the twilight of our life, um, it's important to be thinking about passing on stories. But even, you know, young people, things happen, right? We get in car accidents. We, you know, I just heard about somebody last week who had a heart attack at 36 and didn't make it out of the hospital. So there's a lot of history that that 36-year-old now is no longer able to pass on to his young daughters. So, um, so tell your story, share your story, and make, pe- make sure that people know how to get to your, uh, to your photos and, and that they know what those photos are, are really um, telling and, w- and why they're important to you. So thank you for joining me. Today is actually the second annual Save Your Photos Day. Again, a combination of the Save Your Photos organization and the National Association of, um, I'm sorry, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, APPO, A-P-P-O dot org, um, have designated this day every year as the National Save Your Photos Day, actually international. We've got international events as well. And um, I really just want to encourage you to take what you've learned from here and uh, do something with your photos. If you're motivated to do something with them yourself, great. If you have great intentions but no time, that's what we're here for. Um, you know, there's always articles on my website and lots of great resources that I share from my peers and from my organization on my Facebook page and other places. So. Follow me, use the tips, but if you just find there, you know, you have great intentions but not enough time, then please let us help you because you can be just one day away from a more peaceful life and you can be telling your story and you can share these precious memories with people in your family. So, uh, again, this last slide is the resources page where a lot of these things that I've talked about is at heartworkorg.com slash photos. Thank you for joining me to get today. Um, I have just a couple of minutes on this recording, so I'm going to invite you at this point, if you have a question and you'd like to hit star six on your telephone pad, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask a question. You can also ask a question in the discussion panel on the um, slide sharing. I'm happy to do that. Or if you have to leave, Thank you for joining us, and please feel free to email me a question later on. So I'm just going to count to 10 here and see if anyone wants to hit star 6 and uh, break in and ask a question that maybe uh, you want to, um, you know, ask about your own situation. Hi, Darla. This is Joanne Brunhofer. Thank you so much. This has been really, really helpful. I have a hi, question Joanne. regarding <laughs> I have a question regarding the backup systems. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I would want to do a backup is that for some reason I continue to get viruses in my computer even though I purchased the the antivirus software and keep all those yes. licenses up to date. And I'm concerned that if you have something attached to your computer that automatically doing a backup, that somehow the virus is going to get into there as well. So, I mean, can that happen? I mean, should these backups be selective backups? Of That's just- a great question. That's a great question. And I'm going through that myself right now, Joanne. I've got something going on with my computer, and we're trying to figure out if it's a uh, virus or, you know, some software that's sort of gone rogue or what's going on. Um, so I feel for you. And it's not a question of if it will happen. It'll happen to somebody. It'll happen to you at any point. You know, at some point in your life, everybody will um, have to deal with this uh, situation. So the question is, you know, how, if we're backing up our photos and we get a virus, does that mean that what we've taken the time to back up is also going to be, you know, at risk? And yes and no. So, um 
so your computer, if you have the, the ability or if you have support like I do, I, this is not something I can do myself. So I have a computer technician on call that I um, have developed a relationship with and I work with um, when something like this happens. So your computer can be uh, oftentimes rolled back to a period before your virus um, attacked your data. Um, sometimes that, that works. Your hard drive, your external hard drive that you may have um, backed up uh, from, your, from your main computer, that often will have a partition in it so that it also is keeping older backups. So it doesn't just keep one last backup. Um, in a perfect or in a great scenario, you're going to have 30 days of daily backups. And if I get a virus today, then I can roll back to, say, two weeks ago. And um, that, that data is all still there, but that was before the virus, you know, got in and, and caused um, havoc. Um, the other thing that you uh, – so that's, that's sort of working outwards, right? So that's your computer and then your external hard drive. And then you have data in the cloud. And so if you have a backup of your data in Carbonite, for example, they do keep rolling 30-day backups. And so same thing. If you, if you aren't able to recover from your computer, you aren't able to recover from your external hard drive, um, then you can go to Carbonite and you can create a backup from there um, of an earlier time when you didn't have that virus problem. Um, and then something like, you know, Shutterfly, Flickr, Mylio. Uh, Mylio is kind of mm, in and out on that question, but um, these are going to be backups of your photo library that are not actually connected to your computer. So it's, you're going to not ever have a virus, say, in your Flickr account. You may have other problems in your Flickr account, but you're not going to transfer your virus that somehow you got on the Internet and went through your computer over to your Flickr account. That doesn't happen. So if you're regularly backing up to um, these multiple places, one library may be at risk where another library would not be. So okay. there's not one size fits all because every single one of you who joined the call today is going to have a different photo solution. And what I do oftentimes with people is they'll say, you know, oh, I'm backed up. I have an, an external hard drive. Well, I find out they're never plugging it in. So, yeah, they have it, but it's not working for them. You know, it's not actually backing anything up because it's never plugged in. Or that's the only place that they're ever backing up. I say, look, you know, we need to back up your stuff to, you know, Flickr, Dropbox, whatever, um, so that we have something that is not going to be affected by a virus if that were to occur. So I actually sit down and plan out with people what they are doing. And then on a monthly basis, we have um, either a, an in-person visit if we're doing a lot of photo work, or we have a phone call, and we will go through the checklist, and I'll say, okay, great. Now open up your Dropbox. Let's see. Is the last photo you took there? Okay, good. Oh, no, it's not. Why is the, drop, why is the backup failing? And then we'll go through and we'll make sure that all of your backups are actually working like they should on a monthly basis. So, um, so I hope that answered a lot of your question, um, and, and you do want to have actually sort of a, a list on a regular basis you're going through and, and checking and making sure that your photos are where you think they are, because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. And if anyone else has a question, you want to unmute by hitting star six, and then if you want to go back on mute, you can hit star six as well. Um, so I'm just going to wait for one second. Does anybody else have a question? Okay, I don't hear any other questions on this call. I really appreciate you joining today. Um, I am going to do my best to take this recording and share it with you. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to happen, but um, be on the lookout. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for going to my website and looking for these resources I've mentioned, if they can help you. Certainly go to the resource page. It's heartworkorg.com slash photos and you'll see links to all of the things that I've talked about and maybe even a few that I didn't that um, would, would help you out. And certainly if I can help you out personally, whether you are uh, in the Philadelphia area or you're someplace else nationwide, please email me at darla at heartworkorg.com. I would love to hear from you. Thanks, and have a happy Save Your Photos Day. Bye.